Welcome, dear friends, to a tale of love, betrayal, and redemption. Enjoy the story. The sterile walls of St. Mary's Hospital seemed to close in on Debbie Wilson as she stared at the tiny bundle in her arms. Tears streamed down her face, leaving mascara trails on her pale cheeks. This was supposed to be the happiest day of her life. Instead, it felt like her world was crumbling around her. Mrs. Wilson, Dr. Thompson said gently, his weathered face creased with concern. I know this is a lot to take in, but I need to make sure you understand your son's condition. Debbie nodded numbly, her eyes never leaving the wrinkled face of her newborn son. He looked so perfect, so innocent. How could this be happening? Samuel has a rare genetic disorder called treacher collin syndrome, the doctor continued. It affects the development of bones and tissues in the face. He may face challenges with breathing, eating, and hearing as he grows. But he'll be okay, right? Debbie's voice cracked as she spoke. He'll live a normal life? Dr. Thompson's hesitation spoke volumes. With proper care and support, many individuals with Treacher Collins lead fulfilling lives. But I won't sugarcoat it, Mrs. Wilson. The road ahead will be challenging. As the doctor's words washed over her, Debbie's mind raced back to that rainy day three years ago, when her life had changed forever. The rain pelted down mercilessly as Debbie huddled under the flimsy bus stop shelter. Her second-hand coat was soaked through, and her dyed blonde hair clung to her face in wet tendrils. She checked her watch for the tenth time in as many minutes. The bus was late again. Need a ride? A deep voice called out. Debbie looked up to see a beaten-up Ford pickup idling at the curb. The driver, a ruggedly handsome man with kind eyes, leaned out the window. Oh, um, no thanks, Debbie stammered. I'm just waiting for the bus. The man chuckled. Honey, that bus ain't coming. Tree fell across the road about a mile back. Why don't you hop in? I can at least give you a dry place to wait until help comes. Against her better judgment, Debbie found herself climbing into the passenger seat of the stranger's truck. As she settled in, she caught a whiff of pine and motor oil, an oddly comforting combination. I'm Mike, the man said, offering his hand. Mike Johnson. Debbie Wilson, she replied, shaking his hand. Thanks for this. I was starting to think I might grow gills out there. Mike laughed, a warm, rich sound that made Debbie's heart skip a beat. Well, we can't have that. Pretty girl like you turning into a fish? That'd be a real shame. As they sat in the broken-down truck, waiting for a tow, Debbie found herself opening up to Mike in a way she never had with anyone before. She told him about her dreams of becoming a nurse, her struggles to make ends meet while putting herself through community college, and her determination to build a better life than the one she'd left behind in her small, gossipy hometown. Mike listened intently, his eyes never leaving her face. When Debbie finally ran out of words, he reached out and tucked a damp strand of hair behind her ear. You're something else, Debbie Wilson, he said softly. I've got a feeling you're going to change my life. Little did either of them know just how prophetic those words would turn out to be. Six months after that fateful, rainy day, Debbie found herself standing on the porch of an imposing Victorian house, her palms sweating as Mike rang the doorbell. Relax. Mike whispered, squeezing her hand. My mom's gonna love you. But as the door swung open to reveal a stern-faced woman with perfectly coiffed silver hair and piercing blue eyes, Debbie's hopes for a warm welcome evaporated. Michael, the woman said, her voice as cold as a Midwest winter. You're late. Sorry, Mom, Mike replied, leaning in to kiss her cheek. Traffic was a nightmare. Mom, this is Debbie. Debbie, meet my mother, Rachel Johnson. Debbie extended her hand, summoning her most winning smile. It's so nice to meet you, Mrs. Johnson. Mike's told me so much about you. Rachel's eyes raked over Debbie, taking in her modest sundress and scuffed pumps. Her lips pursed as if she'd tasted something sour. Charmed, I'm sure, she said, ignoring Debbie's outstretched hand. Well, don't just stand there. Come in before the neighbors start to talk. As they followed Rachel into a living room that looked like it belonged in a museum, Debbie's heart sank. This was not going to be the meet-the-parents experience she'd hoped for. The next hour was an exercise in thinly-veiled insults and passive-aggressive jabs. 
Rachel questioned everything from Debbie's family background. Oh, your father was a mechanic? How quaint? To her career aspirations. A nurse? Well, I suppose someone has to do it. By the time they left, Debbie was fighting back tears. In the car, Mike pulled her close, kissing the top of her head. I'm so sorry, Deb, he murmured. Mom's just set in her ways. She'll come around, I promise. But as they drove away from the grand house on Maple Street, Debbie couldn't shake the feeling that Rachel Johnson was going to be a formidable obstacle in her pursuit of happily ever after. Despite Rachel's disapproval, Mike and Debbie's relationship blossomed. They moved in together, got engaged, and finally tied the knot in a small ceremony at the local courthouse. Rachel's absence was conspicuous, but Debbie was determined not to let it dampen her joy. As the months passed, Debbie threw herself into building a life with Mike. She finished her nursing degree, landing a job at the local hospital. Mike's construction business took off, allowing them to buy a modest but comfortable home in a nice neighborhood. When Debbie discovered she was pregnant, it felt like the final piece of their perfect life falling into place. Mike was ecstatic, twirling her around their kitchen as they laughed and cried tears of joy. But Rachel's shadow loomed large over their happiness. At every family gathering, she found ways to criticize Debbie's choices. From her decision to keep working during the pregnancy to the common name they'd chosen for the baby. Samuel? Rachel had scoffed when they announced it at Thanksgiving dinner. Why not something with a bit more... class? After all, he'll be carrying on the Johnson family name. Debbie had gritted her teeth and smiled, reminding herself that in just a few short months, she'd be holding her beautiful baby boy. Nothing else mattered. Now, as she cradled that same baby boy in her arms, his future suddenly uncertain, Debbie felt a wave of guilt wash over her. Had she done something wrong? Was this somehow her fault? Mrs. Wilson? Dr. Thompson's voice cut through her spiraling thoughts. Is there someone we can call for you? Your husband, perhaps? Debbie nodded, fumbling for her phone with shaking hands. As she dialed Mike's number, she sent up a silent prayer. Please, let him understand. Let him be strong enough for both of us. Mike Johnson was elbow-deep in drywall dust when his phone rang. Wiping his hands on his jeans, he fished the device from his pocket, grinning when he saw Debbie's name on the screen. Hey, beautiful, he answered cheerfully. How's our little slugger doing? Keeping you up all night already? The silence on the other end of the line made his smile falter. Deb? You there? Mike? Debbie's voice was barely above a whisper. Something's wrong with Sam. As Debbie explained their son's condition, her words punctuated by quiet sobs, Mike felt the world tilt on its axis. This couldn't be happening. Not to them. Not to his son. I... I gotta go, he mumbled, hanging up before Debbie could respond. In a daze, Mike climbed into his truck and started driving. He had no destination in mind. He just knew he couldn't go to the hospital. Couldn't face the reality of what Debbie had told him. Before he realized where he was going, Mike found himself pulling into his mother's driveway. Rachel opened the door before he could even knock, one look at his face telling her all she needed to know. Oh, Michael, she said, pulling him into a hug. What's happened? As Mike poured out the story, Rachel's face hardened. When he finished, she took his hands in hers, her voice low and urgent. Michael, darling, I hate to even suggest this, but are you sure the baby is yours? Mike recoiled as if he'd been slapped. What? Mom, how can you even ask that? Rachel's eyes were full of sympathetic concern, but there was a glint of something else, something calculating. I'm just saying, sweetheart, these things happen, and Debbie, well, she's not exactly from our world, is she? Who knows what she might be capable of? As Rachel's poisonous words seeped into Mike's already confused and frightened mind, a seed of doubt took root. Could it be true? Could Debbie have betrayed him like this? Rachel Johnson strode through the hospital corridors like a woman on a mission. Her Gucci heels clicked against the linoleum, turning heads as she passed. She paused outside room 305, smoothing her designer suit before pushing open the door. Debbie looked up from the bassinet where baby Sam lay sleeping, her face lighting up with hope. Mrs. Johnson, I'm so glad you're here. Is Mike with you? Rachel's lip curled in distaste as she took in Debbie's disheveled appearance. 
No, dear, Michael is processing the news. I thought it best if I came alone. Debbie's face fell, but she rallied quickly. Would you like to meet your grandson? He's sleeping now, but that won't be necessary, Rachel cut her off. In fact, I think it's best if we keep this conversation between us. Nurse, she called to a passing staff member, would you mind watching the baby for a moment? Mrs. Wilson and I need to speak privately. Once they were alone, Rachel's demeanor changed completely. Gone was the facade of concern, replaced by cold fury. Listen carefully, you little gold digger, she hissed. I know what you've done, and it stops now. You're going to take that child and leave town tonight. There's a house on the outskirts of Millbrook, 1242 Sycamore Lane. Go there. Everything you need will be provided. Debbie's eyes widened in shock. Mrs. Johnson, I don't understand. I can't just leave. Mike. Mike wants nothing to do with you or that baby, Rachel snapped. Face it, dear. Your little plan to trap my son has failed. Now you have two choices. Leave quietly with your offspring, or I'll make sure everyone knows the truth about your sordid past. I'm sure the hospital board would be very interested to learn about the real reason you left your last job. Debbie's face paled. How did you... I have my ways, dear. Now what's it going to be? A fresh start with your son or complete ruination? Tears streaming down her face, Debbie nodded in defeat. Okay, she whispered. I'll go. Rachel's smile was all teeth and no warmth. Wise choice. Oh, and Debbie, don't even think about contacting Michael. If you do, all bets are off. As Rachel sauntered out of the room, Debbie collapsed into the chair by Sam's bassinet. How had everything gone so wrong, and what was she going to do now? The house at 1242 Sycamore Lane was a far cry from the cozy home Debbie had shared with Mike. Paint peeled from the weathered siding, and the porch sagged ominously. As Debbie approached, clutching Sam to her chest, she wondered if this was all some cruel joke. The front door creaked open before she could knock, revealing a disheveled man in his late thirties. His bloodshot eyes and the strong smell of whiskey made Debbie take an instinctive step back. You must be Debbie, the man slurred. Aunt Rachel said you'd be coming. I'm Oliver. Welcome to Casa de Crap. Debbie's heart sank. This was to be her new home? With a drunk stranger and a newborn with special needs? I... I think there's been a mistake, she stammered. Maybe I should go. Oliver's eyes softened as they landed on Sam. Hey, now don't be hasty. Come on in. Let's get the little guy out of the cold. Against her better judgment, Debbie followed Oliver into the house. The interior was as run down as the outside, but it was mercifully clean. Oliver led her to a small bedroom where a crib and changing table had been set up. Aunt Rachel had some of this stuff delivered yesterday, he explained. Said it was for a charity case. Debbie bristled at the term, but her exhaustion outweighed her pride. She laid Sam gently in the crib, marveling at how peaceful he looked, despite the chaos of the past 24 hours. When she returned to the living room, she found Oliver nursing a cup of coffee, looking markedly more sober. All right, he said, gesturing for her to sit. Why don't you tell me what the hell is going on? Because I gotta say, getting a call from my estranged aunt telling me to house a strange woman and her baby, not exactly an everyday occurrence. Over the next hour, Debbie poured out the whole sordid tale, her whirlwind romance with Mike, Rachel's disapproval, Sam's diagnosis, and the ultimatum that had led her to this dilapidated house in the middle of nowhere. When she finished, Oliver let out a low whistle. Damn, and here I thought my family was dysfunctional. Aunt Rachel always was a piece of work, but this, this is a new low. Debbie wiped away a stray tear. I just don't know what to do. I have no money, no job, and a baby who needs more care than I know how to give. Oliver was quiet for a long moment, drumming his fingers on the arm of his chair. Finally, he spoke. All right, here's the deal. You and the little guy can stay here as long as you need. I've got some connections in town. We'll figure out the medical stuff for Sam. And as for money? Well, let's just say Aunt Rachel's not the only one in the family with resources. Debbie's eyes widened in surprise. Why would you help us? You don't even know me. Oliver's lips quirked in a wry smile. Let's just say I've got my own bone to pick with dear Aunt Rachel. 
Besides, he added, his expression softening, that kid of yours deserves a fighting chance. And something tells me you're just the mama bear to give it to him. For the first time since Sam's birth, Debbie felt a glimmer of hope. Maybe, just maybe, they were going to be okay. Two weeks passed in a blur of sleepless nights and worry-filled days. But true to his word, Oliver proved to be an unexpected godsend. He helped Debbie navigate the complex world of medical appointments and therapy sessions for Sam, using his connections to get them in to see the best specialists in the area. One afternoon, Oliver returned from a trip into town with a surprise visitor in tow, a distinguished-looking man in his fifties carrying a black medical bag. Debbie, Oliver called out, I'd like you to meet Dr. Carl Stevens. He's an old friend of mine, and he's here to take a look at Sam. Dr. Stevens turned out to be a leading pediatric specialist with experience in craniofacial disorders. As he examined Sam, his kind eyes and gentle touch put Debbie at ease for the first time since her son's birth. Mrs. Wilson, Dr. Stevens said when he'd finished, I won't lie to you. Samuel faces some challenges, but with the right care and support, there's no reason he can't lead a full, happy life. Tears of relief sprang to Debbie's eyes. Really? You mean he'll be okay? Dr. Stevens smiled warmly. More than okay, I'd wager. Your son is a fighter, Mrs. Wilson, and with a mother as dedicated as you, I have no doubt he'll thrive. As Dr. Stevens outlined a treatment plan for Sam, Debbie felt a weight lifting from her shoulders. For the first time since that terrible day in the hospital, she allowed herself to imagine a future, a happy one for her and her son. Over the next few months, Debbie threw herself into Sam's care with renewed determination. Oliver remained a constant source of support, helping with everything from midnight feedings to driving them to doctor's appointments. As Sam grew stronger, so did the bond between Debbie and Oliver. What had started as an unlikely alliance slowly blossomed into friendship, and then, unexpectedly, into something more. It happened on a quiet evening as they sat on the porch, watching the sunset. Sam was asleep in his bassinet beside them, his tiny chest rising and falling peacefully. You know, Oliver said, breaking the comfortable silence, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm glad Aunt Rachel sent you here. Debbie turned to him, surprised. Even with all the chaos we've brought into your life? Oliver's hand found hers, his touch sending a jolt of electricity through her. Especially because of that. Deb, you and Sam, you've given me a reason to get my act together, to be better. As their eyes met, Debbie felt her heart skip a beat. Without thinking, she leaned in, her lips meeting Oliver's in a soft, hesitant kiss. When they pulled apart, both were smiling. Well, Oliver said, a hint of his old mischief in his eyes. I guess that answers that question. From that moment on, their little makeshift family felt complete. Oliver doted on Sam as if he were his own, and Debbie found herself falling more in love with both of them every day. Three years passed in the blink of an eye. The rundown house on Sycamore Lane had been transformed, much like its inhabitants. Fresh paint, a thriving garden, and the sound of children's laughter had breathed new life into the once dilapidated property. On a sunny Saturday afternoon, Debbie chased after a giggling Sam in the local park. Despite the challenges he'd faced, Sam had grown into a happy, energetic little boy. His facial differences were still apparent, but they did nothing to dim the light in his eyes or the joy in his laughter. I'm gonna get you, Debbie called out her own laughter bubbling up as Sam darted between the playground equipment. Suddenly, a pair of strong arms scooped Sam up from behind. Gotcha, squirt! Oliver's voice boomed as he tossed Sam into the air, catching him safely as the boy squealed with delight. Debbie's heart swelled as she watched them together. Oliver had legally adopted Sam the previous year, and the bond between father and son was unbreakable. Ice cream! Sam demanded pointing towards the small cafe at the edge of the park. What do you say, Mama Bear? Oliver asked, wrapping an arm around Debbie's waist. Should we indulge the little monster? Debbie was about to agree when she froze, her eyes locked on two figures approaching from across the park. Even after three years, she would recognize them anywhere. Mike and Rachel Johnson strode towards them, 
looking like they'd stepped out of a country club catalog. Rachel's eyes widened in shock as she took in the scene before her, while Mike's face drained of color. Debbie? Mike's voice was barely above a whisper. Is that... is that Sam? Debbie instinctively pulled Sam closer, while Oliver's arm tightened protectively around her waist. Hello, Mike, Debbie said, her voice steadier than she felt. Yes, this is Sam, your son. Rachel's face contorted with fury. How dare you show your face here, after everything you've done? That's enough, Aunt Rachel, Oliver cut in, his voice cold. You don't get to speak to my wife that way. Mike's head snapped up at that. Wife? Oliver? What the hell is going on here? Oliver's smile was sharp enough to cut glass. Well, cousin, it seems your mother's little plan backfired. She sent Debbie and Sam to me, thinking I was still the family drunk. But as it turns out, they were exactly what I needed to turn my life around. Rachel sputtered, her carefully crafted facade crumbling. Oliver, you don't understand. This woman, she... Save it, Oliver snapped. I know exactly what you did. How you lied to Mike, how you threatened Debbie. Well, guess what? Your perfect little plan failed. Debbie and Sam are my family now, and I'll be damned if I let you hurt them again. Mike looked between Debbie and Oliver, his expression a mixture of confusion and pain. Debbie, I... I'm so sorry. I should have listened to you. I should have been there. Debbie felt a pang of sympathy for the man she'd once loved, but it was overshadowed by the strength of her love for Oliver and the life they'd built together. You're right, Mike. You should have been there. But you weren't. Oliver was. He's been here for every doctor's appointment, every milestone, every sleepless night. He's Sam's father in every way that matters. Sam, sensing the tension, tugged on Oliver's sleeve. Daddy, can we go get ice cream now? Oliver's face softened as he looked down at his son. You bet, buddy. Come on, let's go. As they turned to leave, Debbie paused, looking back at Mike and Rachel. I forgive you, she said softly. Both of you. But Sam doesn't need your drama in his life. He's happy, he's healthy, and he's loved. That's all that matters. With that, Debbie took Oliver's hand, and the little family walked away, leaving a stunned Mike and Rachel in their wake. As they approached the ice cream stand, Oliver pulled Debbie close, pressing a kiss to her temple. You okay? he murmured. Debbie nodded, watching as Sam debated between chocolate and strawberry flavors. You know what? I really am. For the first time in a long time, I feel like everything is exactly as it should be. Oliver's answering smile was full of love and pride. That's because it is, Mama Bear. It really is. As they sat on a park bench, enjoying their ice cream and each other's company, Debbie marveled at the twists and turns her life had taken. The path hadn't been easy, but it had led her exactly where she was meant to be, surrounded by love, strength, and the kind of happiness she'd once only dreamed of. Sam's laughter rang out, pure and joyful, as Oliver pretended to steal a bite of his ice cream. And in that moment, Debbie knew with absolute certainty that this, this beautiful, messy, perfect life, was worth every struggle, every tear, and every moment of uncertainty. This was her happily ever after, and she wouldn't change a thing.